Okay, so the uh, title of my talk is uh, Victor Shlovsky's Critique of Political Economy, <clears throat> or Victor Shlovsky's Critique of a Political Economy of Art. Victor Shlovsky begins his seminal text, Art as Device, with critiques of diverse formulations of the, quote, laws of economy governing creative effort and perception in poetic and prose language. These laws are turned on their head by Shlovsky to describe the process by which the device of art makes perception long and laborious, end quote. For Shlovsky, art, in short, is not efficient. For Leon Trotsky, this aspect of Shlovsky's thought is framed as a betrayal of materialism and Marxism. For he insists that man tries to maintain an economy of energy in every kind of creation, even in the artistic. Recent Marxist, yet recent Marxist accounts insist that both communism and art's contemporary viability or relevance are premised on the critique and destruction of economy rather than their re realization under improved management. Excusing formalist critic Boris Eichenbaum's scientific gloss, we might assert that, quote, formalist science lives not by settling on truth, but by overcoming error. Then errors must be made in order to be overcome. <clears throat> Art, proceeding interminably by digression, responds to economy negatively, in tension with every effort to coerce, regulate, or contain it. Hmm. So behind me is a picture of um, some futurists and formalist critics. So the bald-headed figure um, with his head kind of pointing down is uh, Viktor Shlovsky. You'll see uh, Vladimir Marikovsky off to the right, and Osip Brick, and Vavara Stepanova, Lily Brick, and others. Initially a participant in the Russian Futurist Circle in St. Petersburg, which included uh, David Berliuk, Vladimir Merkovsky, and Belomir Klebnikov, Viktor Shlovsky became an important critic and theorist of art and literature in the 1910s and 1920s in Russia. In 1916, he founded OPIAS, um, which stood for uh, the Society for the Study of Poetic Language, with Yuri Tinyanov, Osip Brick, and Boris Eichenbaum. Up to its dissolution in the 1930s, the group developed the innovative theories of literature characterized as Russian formalism. Shlovsky participated in the Rev Russian Revolution of uh, February 1917. However, immediately after the revolution of October 1917, he sided with the socialist revolutionary group against the Bolsheviks, and he was forced, as a consequence, to hide in the Ukraine, returning to participate in the civil war in, later in 1919, and then fleeing again to 1922, to Berlin, where he stayed until 1923. In Berlin, he published um, a book called Knight's Move, which is a collection of short essays and reviews <clears throat> written in a period spanning the first few years of the revolution. And Sentimental Journey, his memoirs, his memoir of the years of revolution and, ex and exile from 1917 to 1922. Shlovsky's novel, Zoo, Letters Not About Love, includes 
It's a, which is a novel entirely made up of letters includes a letter appealing to the Soviet authorities to allow him to return to Russia. <clears throat> this and the intercession of his literary peers, Maxim Gorky and Vladimir Mayakovsky, secured his return to Russia. However, in the context of Soviet Marxism's suspicion of Viktor Shlovsky's anti-Bolshevik past, and the popularity of formalism, Shlovsky found fewer and fewer opportunities to publish in the 1920s. He instead sought employment in the state cinema of Goshkino as a script screenwriter, where he worked with directors such as Lev Kuleshev, Abraham Room, and Boris Barnett. Shlovsky's novel, Third Factory, published in 1926, represents an attempt to address his critics. As increasingly savage attacks by Marxists were brought to bear upon the influence of formalism on the study of literature, throughout the 1920s, Boris Eichenbaum published The Theory of the Formal Method in 1926, codifying the formalist approach as a science and defending its relevance to Marxist critics. Viktor Shlovsky made his final pr public pronouncement on formalism in a contra contra contradictory and satirical self-critical text entitled Monument, A Monument to Scientific Error. With, uh, with Mayakovsky's suicide in April 1930 and the Stalinist purges which followed throughout the 1930s, um, in which uh, other formalists, Boris Eichenbaum, for example, Boris Eichenbaum was accused of, quote, root, rootless cosmopolitanism and forced to withdraw into academic work. Uh, Roman Jakobsen moved to Prague. Um, after 1931, Shlovsky retreated, publishing only a car manual and two children's stories until 1940, uh, when the authorities' rehabilitation of Mayakovsky in the 40s allowed Shlovsky to publish his um, book, Mayakovsky and his circle. Um, they were close, very close friends. And this is a picture of them at the beach. <laughs> so, um, Viktor Shlovsky is a very contradictory and problematic figure in many ways, controversial figure. <clears throat> and I, I'll argue that we can't uncritically or unproblematically recover Shlovsky for mar contemporary Marxist thought. However, Shlovsky's work does present useful tools or devices for renewing some specific vectors of Marxist or communist thought today. And this is because Marxist aesthetics and cultural criticism has moved on significantly from its narrow relationship to Bolshevism immediately following the revolution or dialectical materialism. In a period of renewed attention to the object, as well as renewed propositions of the political valences of poetics, I've been working on and with Shlovsky in order to rethink the relationship of the critique of political economy with culture or in culture. Recent approaches by Marxist critics to culture have involved renewed focus and attention to culture, artistic and literary production, which places labor at its material center rather than posing it as something external. Um, one of the proponents of such an approach 
uh, is UK, the UK art historian John Roberts, who proposes a, quote, labor theory of culture. In his text, after Art After De-Skilling, he writes, quote, little has been written on the transformed conditions and understanding of labor in the artwork itself. So little art history and art criticism, certainly since the 60s, has been framed explicitly within a labor theory of culture. In what ways do artists labor? And how are these forms of labor indexed to art's relationship to the development of general social technique? <clears throat> Two key axiom axioms of this approach are as follows. Work is internal to the artwork. The form of artistic labor determines the form of the artwork. Moreover, artistic labor has a different ontology to wage labor and therefore defines itself in relation to it, but negatively or critically. A second axiom, labor cannot serve as a ground for emancipation. That is to say that labor is a capitalist category. Capital and labor remain bound in antagonism as the central contradiction of capitalism as a mode of production and as a social relation. It's senseless to affirm labor or work. The practice of the exploitation of energetic human expenditure for hu instrumental purpose. So rather, the overcoming of capitalism must involve the abolition of labor as practice and as a class, along with all the other classes which rest upon labor's exploitation. And third axiom, <clears throat> use value has generally been treated as neutral. In, capital, in capitalism, a thing's use might be multiple or even highly subjective, but its necessity, its general social use, is a presupposition for its exchange. This means that for artistic critics of capitalism, there has been an urgent and consistent need to denaturalize the social use of things. Um, another account which stands out in its rigorous attention to the complex mediations between artistic and productive labor is that proposed by Theodore Adorno's aesthetic theory? In his late work, Adorno synthesized a form of aesthetic philosophy heavily indebted to German idealism with a deep critique of material relations under late capitalism. Through its paratactical and dense passages, he elucidates a theory of art and aesthetics grounded in, but resistant to, the dominant, dominant system of exchange and production. <clears throat> um, quote, the, the aesthetic force of production is the same as that of productive labor and has the same teleology. And what may be called aesthetic relations of production, all that in which the productive force is embedded and in which it is active, 
are sedimentations or imprintings of social relations of production. Art's double character as both autonomous and social fact or social doing is incessantly reproduced on the level of its autonomy. It is by virtue of this relation to the empirical that artworks recuperate neutralized what was once literally and directly experienced in life. Stop there. Um. By Adorno's account, it is not the case that art models economy in any affirmative or literal sense. Rather, this relationship is mediated and indirect, marked by the domination of all spheres of social life by economy or the economy under the value form. Unlike science, art does not deny the subjective origins of its own subject objectivity, yet it carries a, tru a truth content derived from this. Art, by pursuing its own ends and incorporating material alien to it, exposes to transformed and transforming perception those imprintings of social relations of production. <clears throat> and, and these become sedimented in material. The art does this by acting as if it were free of those relations which have been the generative matrix from which this material issued forth is perverse and one reason for Philistine condemnation. Yet it is exactly this quality that makes it critical in much more than just an ideological sense. A second quote from Adorno. The basic levels of experience that motivate art are related to those of the objective world from which they recoil. The unsolved antagonisms of reality return in artworks as imminent problems of form. This, not the insertion of objective elements, defines the relation of art to society. So is, there is then, in the attention to imminent problems of form, the sense by which art returns the products of general social technique. These are not returned to the world of utility, but rather the opposite. Hmm. A negative utopia which enables the thought of what is not presently possible. In Viktor Shlovsky's late formulation, in terms of literature, this was nothing less than, quote, a search for the purpose of humanity. Without suggesting a direct con correspondence, I'd like to draw both Adorno and Shlovsky into a relationship of mutual illumination to suggest that certain aspects of their work are both surprisingly complementary and unfinished. Um, there are num numerous coincidences between Adorno and Viktor Shlovsky's thought on the issue of autonomy and artistic intention. For Adorno, art's autonomy is not only derived from its difference from productive labor, art is really made by wage labor, but also its independence from artistic intentionality. For Adorno, the criticality of art lay in the paradox of autonomy. 
Art was autonomous, free, and giving itself its own law. Um, at the same time as it was heteronymous, unfree, imprinted by commodity relations. For Shlovsky, um, quote, art processes the ethics and the worldview of a writer and liberates itself from his original intention. Things change when they land in a book. So attention is therefore drawn to the determinations acting upon art. The, if not dialectical, then definitely circuitous formulation of the freedoms and unfreedoms structuring art. The the this theme is part of a highly self-reflexive and complicated moment in Shlovsky's work. Beset by critics of formalism <clears throat> and slurs re relating to his earlier political associations, Sh Shlovsky's novel, Third Factory, seeks to both construct and destabilize a compromise between Marxism and formalism. In an atmosphere of tightening strictures around writer's work, Shlovsky claims, quote, I am studying the unfreedom of the writer. And later in the same passage, he says, a work of literature lives on in material. Don Quixote and the minor owe their existence to unfreedom. It is impossible to exclude certain material. Necessity creates works of literature. Such statements appear to hover between a rigorous defense of previous claims for the autonomy of art and literature and a sharper assessment of their status as material with inherent determinations as well as making a direct reflection on and answers to the pressures his own writing is being subjected to. In each subsequent description, freedom is defined negatively. Just as his argument for the autonomy of art has led to pressure, on his artful criticism. The study and creation of art requires now, for Shlovsky, unfreedom. So we might think this ostensible freedom in terms of uh, so-called double freedom. Um, what was formulated by Karl Marx as the double freedom of labor power, free to sell itself as commodity, free from, own, free from ownership of property or means of production to work or starve. Marx writes, for the conversion of his money into capital, therefore, the owner of money must meet in the market with the free laborer. Free in the double sense that as a free man, he can dispose of his labor power as his own commodity. And on the other hand, he has no other commodity for sale. He's short of everything necessary for the realization of his labor power. Art, on the other hand, according to Kant, must also be doubly free in an almost symmetrically opposite sense. Free from wage labor, but also like labor, free of having a commodity or other service to sell. Kant writes, 
Fine art must be free in a double sense. It must be free in the sense of not being a mercenary occupation and hence a kind of labor whose magnitude can be judged, exacted or paid for according to a certain standard. But fine art must also be free in the sense that though the mind is occupying itself, it, yet it feels satisfied and amused independently of any pay without looking for some other purpose. <clears throat> Marx's formulation deliberately satirizes bourgeois freedom as exactly its opposite, compulsion and absolute poverty for the proletarian. Kant's formulation of art's freedom reserves for it a special role as the, quote, free sphere in which the contradictions of class society can be resolved ideally. On the other hand, art, an artist, and contemporary art in particular, has always struggled to be paid in a sense in which which directly contravenes Kant's definition. And although art struggles to be paid, it also struggles to remain free of the unfreedom of wage labor. To make art for a wage would be to surrender art's autonomy to the executive command of a capitalist. Therefore, art finds itself positioned as not labor and not capitalist. But its purpose, purposive purposelessness is instrumental to bourgeois society as the privileged space of a particular freedom which justifies general unfreedom. As Shlovsky's self-criticism in 1930 makes clear, quote, it turns out that where a neutrality or lack of so social purpose actually existed, that neutrality was actually pursuing its own strongly directed goals. From Shlovsky's pronouncement in Knight's Move that, quote, art has always been free of life, its flag has never reflected the color of the flag that flies over the city fortress, to the formulation in Third Factory, quote, I am studying unfreedom. Between these two, We travel the distance between a liberal idea of freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, that is, freedom for certain subjects at the expense of others, to a form of freedom defined negatively, an oscillation between freedom and necessity, or, um, yeah, or autonomy and heteronomy. So this emphasizes freedom's negative and determinate sense without an illusion of universality. Shlovsky expresses himself, therefore, by a succession of contradictions. He says, but, quote, but chance is crucial to art. The dimensions of a book have always been dictated to an author. The marketplace gave a writer his voice. Were Shlovsky's contradictions logical, we could say that Third Factory marks a passage from Kant to Hegel. However, what we are pre presented with is instead a plethora of affirmations and negations, apparently paradoxical, which form a dense constellation to be negotiated 
rather than resolved. The idea of progress is held up to attention. Resolution remains suspended and this paradoxical material is worked over and over. The object of this search is both literature and the writer himself. His life, but also the succession of problems and their non-resolution are in arranged in such a way as to be only resolvable, if at all, with recourse to practice. The case for freedom, then, in Shlovsky's third factory, is far from an idea of art for art's sake, but, but rather, when chance is affirmed, it is the heteronymous condition set by literary commerce which ultimately defines. In, in this respect, Shlovsky strongly emphasizes the determination in the last instance of commodity relations. His own motif of the factory emphasizes the produced nature of literature, or literature as a form of production. Furthermore, when Shlovsky discusses the factory, its product is not only the commodity, but the peculiar commodity of labor, human labor power itself. Quote um, from Third Factory. First of all, I have a job at the third factory of Goskino. Second of all, the name isn't hard to explain. The first factory was my family and school. The second was Opiaz, and the third is processing me at this very moment. Do we really know how a man ought to be processed? This passage, which produces a slippage from the factory as a place of work to the place that processes human material, has its echo later in Shlovsky's anthropomorphization of flax, by which the product acquires a voice. Quote, flax, if it had a voice, would shriek at its being processed. It is taken by the head and jerked from the ground by the root. It is sown thickly, oppressed, so that it will not be vigorous, but puny. Flax requires oppression. <clears throat> it is jerked out of the ground, spread out on the fields in some places, or retted in pits and streams. The streams where flax is washed are doomed, the fish disappear. Then the flax is braked and scutched. I want freedom. This play um, and attention to fac the words factory and process can only have been a nod to Shlovsky's avant-garde peers and their many initiatives to dissolve art and artists into the, product, the key productive site for revolutionaries of the day, the factory. However, Shlovsky's characterization of the factory is far from the ideal idealism of his peers. Rather than affirm its magical process of transformation of concatenated human labors, into productive power and heaps of product, Shlovsky emphasizes the ground up byproduct, the human, disfigured and exhausted, thrown out of production as a mere husk. Moreover, this image of violence is extended to the raw material itself. 
As we know, the raw, the byproduct of a production process is not only raw material worked into valuable products, but the labor power which is congealed into the product and which constitutes its value. This production over and over reproduces labor power as separate from its products, separate from the means of making this product and available again to partake in the process over and again. We cannot exactly attribute such insights to Shlovsky himself, but his views do not contradict such a view. Whereas those of many of his Marxist peers, his contemporary Marxist peers and critics, would seem to underplay such a basic analysis of the labor process. The question of separation goes to the heart of the polemics between Marxists and formalists in the 1920s. The formalists attempt to study the internal workings of literature to enumerate the devices used and adapted by writers expunged, of all, expunged all external reference in an attempt to assert a theory which pertained to the internal literariness of literature. And this was opposed to the traditional approach of reading literature's significance through the disciplines of sociology, history, geography, anthropology, or political science. This, this involved studying the constitutive parts of literature and language. By breaking these down and studying the process of genesis and perception in literary works, rather than their social significance. The approach exposed the formalists to criticism that their technique was insufficiently systematic or universal, and that they were proponents of a form of arts for arts, art for art's sake. A few Marxist critics, however, recognized that in terms of an approach specific to the problems of literature, Marxism or historical materialism had as yet at that time little to offer. Um. <laughs> Yeah, and that they might instead learn from formalism. Shlovsky's retort to his critics in a monument to scientific error was to use Friedrich Engels to show that the study of phenomena or instances of production required exactly the attention to the constituent parts of the phenomena. He, quote, to, to study these separate parts out of their natural or historic connections and inquir inquire in each case separately into their qualities, their special causes, and their operation. I would, I would, I would agree that whilst the systematic construction of a complete theory for literature and art was not something formalism achieved or even began. But the individual studies by formalists, by treating each literary production as a specific instance with its own elements, devices, techniques, is the closest thing we have in the history of literature or literary study to the process that Marx attempted 
with regards to the specific, his study of the specific instances of the labor process in capitalism. Okay, another instance of separation. Shlovsky consistently emphasized the incommensurability of everyday life experience and literature. Initially in the separation of everyday speech and literary language. Quote, these two languages, that is the poetic and the practical do not coincide. On the other hand, the liveliness of Shlovsky's descriptions, his biographical and autobiographical digressions, his insistence upon the vivacious role of art versus the monotony and deadening effects of automatic or habituated perception suggest otherwise. Here I'd like to indicate that in his opposition of mechanization to elasticity of dead material to life, Shlovsky seems to strongly associate with one of the key preoccupations of Bergsonian vitalism. We might also ally Shlovsky to the eccentric vitalism of both Marcel Duchamp and Francis Picabia. And this is a so-called mechanomorph by uh, Francois Picabia, um, where he basically produced a series of kind of drawing poems by tracing uh, scientific illustrations um, from contemporary magazines. Um, So, yeah, so both Marcel Duchamp and Picabia, his introduction of mechanical elements into art tended to critique both art, in the sense of anti-art, by being anti-art, and industrial modernity, celebrating, by contrast, the convulsive, aleatory, and passionate life of the organic. So this is an image of the large glass covered in dust. It's called um, dust breeding. So there's this sort of sense that this kind of waste of kind of modern society is actually kind of like a living, very, li very much a living matter. So there's a sort of, yeah. So I'd like to suggest then a corresponding effort on Shlovsky's part, but a similar resistance to this kind of measurement um, imposed in modernity lives in his tendency towards digression, inutility, and against instrumentalization, which amounts to not only a attention to the poetic object, but also makes criticism itself poetic and poetic thoughts critical. Okay. One of the key motifs in Viktor Shlovsky's writing is the automobile. The, the, the automobile was both the site of work for Shlovsky. He worked as a driver and a mechanic in the army. And later, he wrote a technical manual for a car. But it's also a significant icon com and commodity exemplary of capitalist modernity. This is uh, the image behind me is uh, actually Lenin's um, car. It's a Model T Ford, and um, the people sitting in it were uh, members of the Latvian Guard, uh, 
Um, I think it's taken in 1918. But also, uh, they were artists, or some of them were artists. So, and um, at least three of them were important constructivist artists, um, or became important constructivist artists after this. Um, Okay, a quote from uh, Viktor Shlovsky's, I think it's from uh, Zoo. The machine gunner and the con contrabassist are extensions of their instruments. Subways, cranes, and automobiles are the artificial limbs of mankind. Drivers change in proportion to the amount of pay power in the engines which propel them. An engine of more than 40 horsepower annihilates the old moral morality. Speed puts distance between a driver and mankind. S start the engine, press on the gas, and you have forthwith left space behind. While time seems measured only by the speedometer. For Shlovsky, things are sensory extensions of man, but also transform his sensation and use him as their own extensions of their purpose. Rather than a simple curtailment of autonomy, both man and thing are autonomous, make their own rules and impress themselves upon their objects. There is nothing unnatural about the shaping of life by things, but rather there are degrees, the machine being the most extreme and, apparent, and apparently of another order than nature's shaping of man. Another quote about the car by Shlovsky. Things make of man whatever he makes from them. Speed requires a goal. Things are multiplying around us. There are ten or even a hundred times more of them than now. Sorry, there are there are ten or even a hundred times more of them now than there were two hundred years ago. Mankind has them under control, but the individual does not. The individual needs to master the mystery of machines. A new romanticism is needed, or machines will throw people out of life on the curves. At the moment, I am bewildered because this tire polished asphalt, asphalt, these neon signs and well dressed women, all this is changing me. Here I am not as I used to be. Here it seems I fall short. So Shlovsky reveals a kind of fear of both mechanization and feminization through things, particularly machines. Through speed, machines and the human embedded in them annihilate space and time. Speed requires a goal. This changes the shape of human sense perception, but also the structure of time, and by implication, even the destiny or destination of life. So automobiles are a cipher for, for the overtaking, also become a cipher for the overtaking of the slow old order and, and a sign of the revolution going out of control by the super empowerment of isolated individuals 
by the apparatus of the machines. Last quote by Shlovsky on cars. You brought the revolution sloshing into the city like foam. Fo sorry, like fo foam. <laughs> so you brought the revolution sloshing into the city like foam. Oh, automobiles. The revolution shifted gears and drove off. So here the image that I'm displaying is a kind of oblique way of referring to Lenin's um, policy of tailorization of industry, which commenced in the 20s, in the early 20s, under the rubric for a new economic plan. And I think uh, with this image and with the previous Shlovsky quotes, we can begin to think about this kind of contradictory a multivalent reference of the car as a subtle critique of the mechanization under the NEP in Russia. Um, it was quite a common, um, it was quite common for Mayakovsky, but also many of uh, Shlovsky's peers to use science fiction and technologized kind of literature, or liter new literature of technology to satirize this kind of Soviet policy because they saw not the realization of communism, but rather a kind of runaway of a kind of a then distinctly capitalist form of technology. It's both uh, it's elasticity and her historicity of language. Whereas what is emphasized in the description of machines and technology is destruction. And this may not be surprising considering that Shlovsky lived in extremely destructive times. Shlovsky is, was criticized by many among them, uh, more recently, Frederick Jameson, for a lack of historical insight. Yet we might counter that as a Lukashian, and we can include Leon Trotsky, who we'll refer to later, Jameson remains exposed to Moshe Postone's critique of Lukash and his celebration of historical process. Postone points out that life under capital is characterized by, quote, a, historic, a historical dynamic beyond human control. Siding with this process rescues nothing. In real subsumption, Historical, historical process, as such, cannot be opposed to capitalism. While capital, capital imposes unity, empty humo homogenous time, the attention to artworks instead sharpen our sense of the particular, the fragmentary, and its undigestible heterogeneity. <clears throat> Shlovsky says, quotes, social reality is stepped. It is multi-temporal. The epochs in it either clash or peacefully coexist. Another way of considering history within literature is through questions of literary succession and influence. And in their later work, the formalists address this. So a quote from uh, Yuri Tinyanov um, from his book on Dostoevsky and Gogol. 
There is no continuing direct line. There is rather a departure, a pushing away from a known point, a struggle. Any literary succession is first of all a struggle, a destruction of old values and a reconstruction of old elements. Um, Boris Eichenbaum, um, from his theory of the formal method, quote, the basic position for our literary historical work had to be a passion for destruction and negation. And such was the original tone of our theoretical attacks. Our work later assumed a calmer note when we went on to the solutions of particular problems. And lastly, Viktor Shlovsky. The work of art arises from the background of other works and through association with them. The form of a work of art is defined by its relation to other works of art, to forms existing prior to it. Not only parody, but also any kind of work of art is created parallel to and opposed to some kind of form. The purpose of the new form is not to express new content, but to change an old form which has lost its aesthetic quality. From these statements, we can reconstruct a perspective whereby art is influenced by the history of forms which preceded it, but moves forward through negation and struggle rather than peaceful coexistence. Furthermore, this implies that criticism itself is also historical and must move with its object, even absorb and learn from its transformed and transforming power. So today I want to end the lecture by focusing attention on the idea of energy as a theme in of Viktor Shlovsky's work and theme which has quite revolutionary implications if we apply it critically to present society. And we could even use this to organize a number of critics hostile to formalism into a category we could call energetic conservatives or energy conservationists. Okay, my prime example here will be Leon Trotsky, whose book, Literature and Revolution, did, dedicated a chapter to critiquing the work of the Russian formalists, and Viktor Shlovsky in particular. Um, Trotsky doesn't only say negati negative things. Um, he insists, uh, quote, a certain part of the research work of the formalists is useful. However, he singles out Viktor Shlovsky's book, Night's Move, for harsh criticism. In it, Viktor Shlovsky allegedly well, critiques a materialist position. Yet from the writing quoted, we can glean that Shlovsky is either glibly misinterpreting or doesn't exactly know what he's, think he's talking about. 
On the other hand, uh, Trotsky can only, in response, make crude and general analogies between art and class society, mostly in terms of reflection or considering art as a form of psychological deflection by the artist. Um, he makes a good point uh, in agreement with Shlovsky in some sense. However fantastic art may be, it cannot have at its disposal any other material except that which is given to it by the world of three dimensions and by the narrower world of class society. Nonetheless, whilst Trotsky grants art its own special laws for lack of attention to what these might be, how they might be conditioned, or to a single reference to labor or production, apart from when he quotes Shlovsky himself, let alone art's particular circumstances of production suggests that neither interloc interlocutors are particularly well qualified in this discussion of Marxism and art. One of the weaknesses of Trotsky's thought at this time becomes apparent as he attempts to make an analogy between formalism and theological opposition to Darwinism. The analogy turns on the Orthodox Church's belief in the separation of spheres. And he again accuses uh, Shlovsky of this problem of separating literary production from all the other forms of production. However, in this instance, it's interesting, having invoked Darwin, to see what Marx himself said about Darwin. In 16, on the 16th of January, 1861, Marx wrote to Ferdinand Lassalle, quote, Darwin's book is very important and serves me as a basis in natural science for the class struggle in history. One has to put up with the crude English method of development, of course. Despite all deficiencies, not only is the death blow dealt here for the first time to quote teleology in the natural sciences, but their rational meaning is empirically explained. However, by the 18th of June 1862, Marx appears to have reassessed his view. He says, he wrote the following, I'm amused that Darwin, at whom I've been taking another look, should say that he also applies, quote, the Malthusian theory to plants and animals. It is remarkable how Darwin rediscovers among the beasts and plants the society of England with its division of labor, competition, opening up of new markets, inventions, and Malthusian struggle for existence. So um, Marx is simply kind of doing a literary analysis of Darwin to say rather than Darwin seeing in nature something original, he simply sees the society of which he's already a part. So he just simply naturalizes 
capitalist society. This uh, reflexivity of thought, of the effects of thought's conditions upon itself, is typical of Marx, and I would like to argue not uncommon in Shlovsky. This critical relationship to science, a certain constructivist approach to language, which allows for the flexibility of purchase and irony, appears throughout Shlovsky's work. This is not the case with Trotsky, whose uncritical defense of science, quote science, leads him to argue that man tries to maintain an economy of energy in every kind of creation, even in artistic. <clears throat> in an essay on Marx and Adorno, Simon Jarvis emphasizes Marx's denaturing of capitalist society and its norms, which are often reproduced in crude Marxism. One recurrently, quote, one recurrently tempting alternative has been to offer a theory of economy based on a distinction between real and artificial needs. But the concept of real need is itself, as Marx showed, twinned indissolubly with that of profit. The notion of the bare minimum, the strict necessaire, emerges coevally with that of surplus value as, quote, a gift of nature. To found an economic anthropology on such a concept of absolute need, the bare minimum, is to make, mistake the bare existence of the wage laborer for the very model of life itself. This sums up for me um, a central weakness for Trotsky in this debate, and one which Marxism in its encounter with art must learn, or mu must learn from. Sorry. The, the ascetic impulse is never neutral, but nor is the reductionist view. Bare life is also an ascetic view or viewpoint, but it is just an impoverished one. In an often quoted passage from Art as Device, the text Art as Device, Shlovsky explains how the device of art makes perception long and laborious. It is specifically an attack on the theories of Alexander Poitabinia, but also cites Herbert Spencer, an English critic, to address the tendency by which a law of, of, a law of the economy of creative effort is generally accepted. So what I think Shlovsky was doing here provides the ground for doing exactly the opposite of what Trotsky sought to do. <clears throat> and that is re to read art not as a consequence of social conditions, but as a critic of them. Shlovsky's assertion of the poetic process and its perception has a curious proximity to Marx's description of sensory attention 
within the labour process in Capital Volume 1. Marx describes how attention, rather than being merely dulled by repetitive work, is in fact compelled to greater attention. Here, difficulty reverses the economy of attention posed by Shlovsky's contemporaries. A peculiar symmetry appears whereby what is difficult, perhaps painful even, is within the reception of an artwork a, a kind of fullness of, re, of meaning. It becomes a provocation of cognition or, or to cognition. Whereas in the labor process, what is automated and simple becomes the greatest effort and an additional strain for the exploited worker. Uh, Shlovsky's contemporaries and future collaborators in LEF might have learned important lessons from this thought as they sought to merge the ontology of artistic and productive labor via the work time rationalization of Taylorism or the Taylor system. Um, as an example, we might read in this context, the rather grisly quote from Sergei Tretyakov's biography of the object. He says, the compositional structure of the biography of the object is a conveyor belt along which a unit of raw material is moved and transformed into useful product through human effort. And in this, he appears to be possibly referring somewhat in a somewhat contradictory way to form, both formalism, but also to a method by which the art might dissolve itself into economic production. Um, propo by proposing a form of sensory labor in the artwork by which a re reader's many-sided fr free play of the physical and mental powers could be expanded to the fullest, Shlovsky did perhaps not realize how close he was to posing a critical labor theory of culture. By Shlovsky's account, art's labor, although I'm not even sure we should call it that, art's process, its attention to the object, transformation of the object, transformation of the subject, produces an activity which breaks with economic form and truth. Art achieves this not only ideally, but as a social and material act, or social and material doing. This means that if we wish to critique political economy, we must keep art's corrosive and mimetic critique in view. This does not mean that art can necessarily be a means for overturning the social order. But since art's praxis and purchase upon society stems from its negative relation to wage labor and its difference to it, we can expect a transformation of both only through a social process which dissolves the categories, norms, and limitations of each 
from inside their constrictions and not from outside of them. So. Kao, kao što sam najavila, prvo preč dajem uh, Zoranu, a onda otvaramo diskusiju. Sve. Pa ja sam uzeo prvi reč, o, zato što smo mi juče razgovarali na, na ovu temu i o ovom predavanju. I na temelju onoga što i od ranije znamo, mi sarađujemo sa Antonijem i, i već su se podudrele mnoge stvari i u vezi sa literaturom koju obrađujemo i čitamo i koja nas zanima, a i propitivanje praksi u kojima se krećemo na takozvane nezavisne sceni, kako se to ovde kod nas naziva. I sad, juče smo imali prilike dakle, da razmenimo ono ideje i da i ovo što bi ja danas polako pročitao ovaj, je, je zapravo jedan rezime i, i jedan niz pitanja, da, tačnije formulacija je, e, ima, ovo što ću reći, ima formu pitanja koje sam i juče postavio, a sada je to već i doterano, malo dorađeno u, u razmeni ideja koje smo imali juče. Dakle, e, govorim iz naše pozicije istraživačke i praktične, e, koju ovde otvaramo i koju delimo sa, o, ambijen, u ambijentu, u ovom miljeju, govorim pre svega o levoj kritici ili kritici, kritici s leva. Tako da se sve ovo što, što pričamo i ovo što se odigrava i danas ovde je zapravo po našem mišljenju jedino mesto ovaj, gde se može govoriti i, i delati politički, a ne u razmeni ideja sa drugom stranom, sa desnicom, to smo i uče pomenuli. Pričali smo dakle o umetnosti i danas smo govorili o umetnosti, ali ja mislim da je problem autonomije nama interesantan, dakle, zato što je ulog politički, jer je reč i o autonomiji politike. Sada bih lagano pročitao ovo što smo juče, o čemu smo juče razgovarali, jer će biti i brže i jasnije. Neću improvizovati. Dakle, naš problem a mislimo i problem materialističkog saznanja je autonomija umetnosti, ako govorimo o umetnosti. Jer ona je za doslednu marksističku i materialističku analizu respektabilna. Respektabilna u svojoj relativnosti i determinisanosti heteronomije. Naučena analiza to uvažava i pitanje autonomije, ako je dakle analiza naučna, metodološko i konceptualno pitanje. Mišljenje autonomije može biti tretirano dijalektički, ali onda naše pitanje je sledeće. Da li je to naučni pristup analizi ili filozofski? Kada je pitanje autonomije tretirano strukturalno, onda je analiza naučna. Dakle, ovo ću ponoviti, jel da? Mišljenje autonomije može biti tretirano dijalektički. Sleva. Mišljenje autonomije može biti tretirano dijalektički. Ali onda naše pitanje je sledeće. Da li je to naučni pristup analizi ili filozofski? Kada je Pitanje autonomije tretirano strukturalno, onda je analiza naučna i ona nastoji ispitati odnose autonomnih instanci, ali autonomnih instanci koncepta kojim se ispituje analizira ili kako je to Altiser znao reći zahvata stvarnost. Neću reći društvo ili je društvo ideologem. Ideologem, ideologija. 
Jasno je onda da se pitanje heteronomnog u relaciji sa poljem čija autonomija je u pitanju, u našem slučaju umetnost ili politika, dakle, uzima se u obzir ta čija autonomija u pitanju uzima u obzir i sva je stvar u tome da li i kako misliti ispoznati uticaj ili učinke determinišuće instance ili niza. Za marksiste to je ekonomija. Odnosno niza nizova, ako uzimamo totalitet, načina proizvodnje, a reč nisu, čini mi se, koristili formalisti. Međutim, da li je pitanje autonomije pitanje same umetnosti i umetničke prakse? Da li umetnik misli i brani autonomiju Da li se za nju bori ili je nastoji ukinuti? Da li su prepreke o kojima govori Medvedev, a sad ću pročitati jedan deo, iskustva granice koju umetnik nastoji probiti ili ih isto tako analizira? I šta je on ako ih analizira? A šta je kada ih krši i probija? Da li se tim kršenjem i probijanjem pravi prolaz ili se zadobija autonomija? Da li je to autonomija delanja i mišljenja? Da li dakle autonomija umetnosti raskida sa normama koje se nameću kao spoljašnje i koje determinišu i ograničavaju. I da li je to put za dobijanje autonomije na način etabliranja posebne institucionalne instance ili njeno rušenje i ukidanje podele rada? Evo tog mesta za nas simptomalnog iz knjige Formalni metod u nauci o književnosti. Tu se kaže, ako su oni u pravu, formalisti, ako struktura umetničkog dela odista nije društvena, onda je primjena sociološkog metoda u nauci o književnosti izuzetno ograničena. On ne dotiče činioce razvitka, već samo prepreke razvitku književnosti. One klinove koje istorija stavlja u točkove evolucije književnosti. Da li se na ovom mestu može prepoznati simptom? Da li je to simptomalno mesto? Čitamo li u ovom pasusu naučnu opasku Medvedeva, upućenoj lošoj ili možda spontanoj nauci formalista, budući da formalisti nisu marksistički sociolozi. I da li je ta spontana nauka, spontana sociologija, ako im se to dopusti, da su sociolozi. A spontana je 
zato što je ograničena, u svojoj spoznaji, pošto ne tretira društvenost umetničkih formi. I gubi mogućnost da spozna zakone promene forme. Da spozna zakone promene forme. Ili u pitanju simptom kojim se marksistička sociologija, ako ova sintagma sama po sebi nije simptomalna, pošto je odnos između istorijskog materializma i sociologije problematičan. Dakle, ili je u pitanju simptom kojim se marksistička sociologija ogleda u praksi formalista i nesvesno suočava sa realnim umetnosti. Ako preskočimo fazu ispitivanja i dokazivanja umetnosti, autonomnosti, pardon, sfera načina proizvodnje, pa onda i sfera ideologije, nizova ideologije, što je u biti analitička i naučna stvar, možemo li odmah otvoriti pitanje materializma ove marksističke sociologije Medvedeva i Bahtina, koja se suočava sa nesvodivošću bića na saznanje. I logično, nesvodivosti bića, umetnosti, nas poznaju umetnosti. I kako sam rekao na početku, ako je ulog politika, naše pitanje je da li je na isti način moguće identifikovati neotvoren problem svođenja politike na nauku o politici, svođenja koje je danas opet među marksistima samorazumljivo. Naše mišljenje da je umetnost mišljenje, baš kao i politika, i da se identifikacija tog mišljenja odvija drugim sredstvima, a ne naučnim. A da je s druge strane umetniku i čoveku koji misli politički i politiku nepotreban naučni paternalizam. A to onda znači ni avangardna partija koja je ponovo tema koja obseda levicu na ovim prostorima. Obsada politike i umetnosti naukom obsada, ovaj put obsada. Obsada politike i umetnosti naukom ima svoje objašnjenje u nauci i klasnoj analizi. A politika i umetnost ne mare za to objašnjenje, već se toj obsadi suprotstavljaju. opiru.
Objašnjenje je naime vrlo jednostavno. I umetnik i onaj koji politički misli znaju da ga u ovom trenutku želi postrojiti i pokoriti akademac i državni službenik koji mu se predstavlja kao avangardni politički radnik i partijac. I zato mislimo da je pitanje autonomije umetnosti na izgled samo pitanje o jednom akademskom i teorijskom problemu. Hvala. Hvala. Should I respond or would anybody like to? <laughs> there were many questions, so you can feel like. Mm. It was very um, rich. <laughs> so. Uh, my, my oh, sorry. Okay, it was very rich. Thank you for the. Um, the to work backwards. The crucial thing to understand is is to understand the question of autonomy of art or question of heteronomy of art is in its is is that it's a labor question that it's a question that pertains to the relations of production So the, the, the form of art that we have will change superficially. Um, whilst we have the same mode of production. Um, I think the, the, I think the question of political autonomy and arts autonomy are kind of both like weak, weakly posed questions in this kind of present. And uh, the, the reason to discuss for me arts autonomy would be to discuss its neg what it's negatively determined by and what it's, and how its arts autonomy is, you know, premised on unfreedom. So the, that's a, a, I guess the sense I take it, the, the sense of a talk, discussing its autonomy in politics, I think to a certain extent, has been far too affirmative for perspective in at least, at least as these discussions have come to us in the UK. And the only purpose of discussing autonomy in the UK context would be discussing all the constrictions that mean there isn't any. But what, what is discussed instead is a kind of illusory freedom. Um, hmm. uh, Yeah, I think it's I think it's very it's quite interesting to think this parallel of art as thought 
and politics as thought, which neither of which are reducible to their relation to the academic sciences. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, let's just check my hand. Um, but I, but I do not think that art is reducible to being a thought. And I'm not so sure that politics is reducible to being a thought. And that's, in a sense, I understand thought. It's rather the material interaction of forces in the world, the, and, and, and the plasticity of thought, but not thought as a individual thought, but rather thought as social doing and social acts. So that's, I think that's. Imali pitanja strane preostale publike? Dok možda još malo razmislite, ja bih možda dodala da, iako je rečeno i to je i u osnovi ovog susreta, mi ga zovemo prijateljskim susretom pre svega, i neka vrsta teorijske i konceptualne prepoznatljivosti u pitanju, pre svega u njenoj osnovi, ipak se oseti i delimična razlika u tome kako posmatramo i šta za koga znači autonomija umetnosti. Če gledno tema ili autonomija bilo koje, ili autonomija bilo koje od instanci, uzimajući u obzir i politiku. Ja bih zapravo osjetila sam potrebu da negde samo dopunim šta je rečeno o konceptu autonomije umetnosti i zašto je ona bitna. Ne zarad status quo autonomije radi autonomije, sad konkretno umetnosti, već da bi kao jednog elementa u društvenoj podeli, jednog od elementa u društvenoj podeli rada, zapravo kroz koncept autonomije umetnosti, koja u okviru svoje oblasti, umetničke oblasti, zapravo vodi borbu sa neprestanim uplivima heteronomije, da kroz tu borbu zapravo svaka instancionalnost i svaka autonomnost pa i umetnosti zapravo nestane u smislu i u krajnjem cilju prekida sa društvenom podelom rada. Teško. Društvena podela rada u smislu prekida sa društvenom podelom rada. Hvala. Hvala za komentar, Branka. Ja, možda je teško da je tražnjena na kraju. Ne znam, možda... Ja, možda je tako da se odgovorim za odgovorim za autonomiju but rather what is the situation. So it's, this is, um, to a certain extent, 
and this responds to Zoran as well, but that the this is what kind of art is in our society. If if a uh, iron rule over art directing its you know um, content or its form in is is made, then people will do something else. People will pursue something else. And I think that there's um, there's obviously a, another form of autonomy, which is simply degrees of autonomy in terms of practice, like how far you are or close you are in relation to, to a funder or to the state and these questions. But I think that um, both of these, I think what I'm also trying to emphasize a bit is the uh, there's a non-resolvability. The, the question of arts autonomy poses itself increasingly in terms which aren't resolvable through art alone. And this is also the problems of politics pose themselves as problems which aren't moving or shifting, but they're stagnant and, and, and won't be resolved by politics alone. So I think, I think that's maybe what Zoran was also describing in terms of this relation between art, politics, and autonomy. Um, and I, I'm sort of, I'm, yeah, quite, I think I missed the, the last part of your statement, but I'd be quite interested to hear more about how you, how you, you, you see that, that problem. Maybe we, we can continue now, but um, dali neko želi da dajem prednost? Hteo bi nešto samo u odbranu mišljenja. A ne mog mišljenja, nego mišljenja kao takvog. Hmm. Ja mislim, ovaj put ja, da pokušavam da uđe materialistički u taj problem. Kod Dirkema imamo, na primer, Emil Dirkem. Imamo materialnost društvene činjenice. Ja mislim da je to već saznato kao nešto što bi danas mogli nazvati struktura. Ta neprobojnost i nepremostivost limita u kojima se kreću naše prakse. I ona se proteže kroz čitavu ideologiju i jezik. Ideologiju i jezik. U tom smislu, mišljenje jeste materijalno. Ono je materializovano. Ali je tada ono naučno saznato. kao objekt, kao objekt spoznaje. I zato ne kao mišljenje. Već kao predstava. Representation. Ideologija. A mišljenje ne uzimam idealistički. idealistika, ali hegelijanski. Hegelijanski, dakle, ne hegelijanski. 
već je u ovom slučaju mišljenje, iskustvo materializma i subjektivnosti. I to ne odmah individualne, ali singularne. I to je iskustvo u kojem imamo saznanje da sprem nas postoji nešto što nismo mi. I zbog toga to nije idealizam. I zato je patetično za jednog idealistu kakav je Hegel. I za jednu logiku hegelijansku i ontologiju kakva je recimo kod nas na fakultetu. Koja je post praksisovska praksis, post praksis hegelijanstvo koje je u biti idealizam i koje mišljenje smatra objektivnim. Nesubjektivnim. A i dalje nematerijalnim. I zato mislim da se materijalnost doživljava subjektivno. Tek kada imamo tu subjektivnost. I kada znamo da stvari ne stoje, stvari ne stoje kako mi umišljamo. Pa čak ni kako mi saznajemo, kada saznajemo naučno, jer imamo iskustvo produbljivanja spoznaje. koje je zapravo raskidanje sa ideologijama kojima se objektalizuje sad ću, kojima, aha, ok, kojima se objektalizuje stvarnost i tada postaje spoznata stvarnost ali stvarnost a ne naše mišljenje, umišljenje. I to je ta nesvodivost stvarnosti na mišljenje. Tot. I zato je politika i umetnost i nauka, konačno, kao mišljenje, sloboda. I u tom smislu, i u tom smislu ona barata materijom, upravlja njome, proizvodi, i to niko ne spore. Ali ljudi misle. Yeah. <laughs>